The first person uh, by phone is Joan Militello. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Ms. Militello? Yes, speaking. Ye yes, hi. Uh, this is Dr. Nancy Lee with the, uh, excuse me, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. Are you prepared now to uh, do your testimony? Yes, I'm just trying to find a, an empty room. Okay. Yes, I am. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, you have five minutes, and we're, um, uh, your testimony is being broadcast to the whole room as well as to anybody that's on the phone. Okay, super. All right, hello everyone. My name is Joan Lovatello. I am the mother of a bright and beautiful 17-year-old daughter whose life has been greatly affected by the lack of knowledge in both the medical and education field regarding ME, CSS, fibromyalgia. Denise came ill in October of 2007 after a bout with shingles. A pediatrician at the time misdiagnosed her because she had never seen a case of shingles. It was a doctor in an urgent care who immediately diagnosed and started treatment. Her pediatrician sent it to a specialist because they did not accept the diagnosis. Ms. Ms. Militello, can you speak a little bit more directly into the speaker of, sure. your, of your phone? Um, okay. Or, this or, is only the did you hear the first part? That's better. Thank you. Okay. This is only the beginning of the nightmare with medical professionals who do not have an open mind to look outside the box. Janina was not able to return to school until February, and it was short-lived. The doctors insisted she had school phobia, as did her school. They pushed it to the point that all she could do was cry. This resulted in turmoil in our house as we argued about forcing her to go to school or letting her stay home. Friends were quick to interject their thoughts. Needless to say, we lost faith in our doctors and turned our phones off to unwanted advice. After watching Janine be forced to attend school for three days with threat of failure, it, was, it became evident to her family that there was something seriously wrong with her. We decided then and there that she was not going back until she was well. I spent many nights surfing the internet for someone to help my daughter. I even wrote to the Center of Disease Control. They wanted to speak to her doctor, but her doctors refused. Um, I still wonder whether they would have been able to help her or not. One pediatrician actually stated, Janine has her own agenda. We never gave up and went to see many specialists who really weren't so special. She was told by a pediatric, pediatric rheumatologist that was supposed to be one of the best that she had fibromyalgia, but she could not stay home from school and must go. We followed his advice for a therapist who took no insurance and after 12 weeks and no improvement, we stopped. Upon receiving copies of his letters to our pediatrician, it was no wonder no one wanted to believe her. It was filled with inaccuracies as to her illness. I have over 10 pages documenting each doctor we have seen and treatments we have tried, and to go into detail about them would take a good day. I'm willing to share our journey, which I update after each visit without adding personal thoughts, because those thoughts wouldn't always be very nice. What I want to share with you is the need for educating the medical professional about ME, CFS, fibromyalgia, especially in young people. Most doctors who deal with young children and adolescents have no idea what is going on in these children and teens. The frustration is so bad that there were times I was worried about my daughter's mental health and it, her ability to keep having people say it was all in her mind. We have gone full circle on our back with the first doctor who nodded and agreed it was chronic fatigue fibromyalgia and understood her symptoms and our frustration. I didn't want to hear that there was no cure and that there was no sure way to make her better. We have spent endless amounts of time and money trying to cure our daughter, and we've come to realize this only by working with this illness that she can keep sane. Jeanine has so many different symptoms that we continue to seek out specialists who can help improve her quality of life. We've met a few who have helped, but for the most part, we get that look of being completely insane. I implore you to create a center of excellence, or at least make the funding available to teach doctors and educators alike about this cruel and debilitating illness. Janine is my hero. 
She always does the best she can and makes no excuses for what she can't. She doesn't need to hear people tell her what she can and can't do. She knows her limitations, but will not let them keep her from being the best that she can be. Her goal is to go away to college because she did not have the high school social experience, as her friends all left her when she was not able to go out with them. We do not discourage her, but tell her to try, and we will regroup if necessary. She does not need others to tell her what she can and cannot do. She will decide what is best for her. She is stronger because of this journey. Thank you for your time and your effort to help all those who suffer with this terrible illness. A special thanks to Dr. Levine and the parents and team members of Speak Up About Me for their support and encouragement to allow Janine and our family to continue to face the challenges that are placed before us. And I beg you, please, have the funding available to enlighten all those who are in the darkness about this illness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we are going to have another testimony by phone Janet Smith. Dr. Smith? Hello? Try again. This is Dr. Smith. Yes, Dr. Smith. This is Nancy Lee at the uh, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. Are you prepared to give your testimony? I am. Good. Um, you have five minutes. Please begin. Hello, I am Dr. Janet Smith. I'm a CFIS patient and a practicing physician and a participant in the only clinical trial for ME-CFS, Amplogen. I would like to thank the CSAC committee for allowing me to testify via telephone. My urological practice started in 1987. I became ill with ME-CFS February of 1994 after a viral infection turned into pneumonia. I have been one of the fortunate people because I can still function in a modified manner, but only with aggressive treatment and with the experimental drug Amplogen, which I have been on for almost 10 years. However, the last 72 hours has proven that each day is a challenge. I felt very well Saturday morning, then in the evening I started with aches, headaches, chills, etc., and by Sunday morning could not even get out of bed to go to the bathroom. I was in tears, unable to make a phone call for help, unable to sit up because of muscle aches were so bad. Then I realized that this is what most people with MECFS experience every day without hope for the future and the feeling that life can't go on like this. Suicides are occurring routinely in the ME-CFS patient group. We need hope, we need help, and we need it now, 
not in five years, not in ten years, but now. I am asking you as a committee to convey this to all, that ME-CFS is real and we need answers, diagnostic markers, and treatments now. Physicians who have treated both AIDS patients and ME-CFS patients concur that ME-CFS patients are much sicker than their HIV patients. In the last two years, the MECFS community has undergone tremendous highs and lows. We need to carry what energy that we now have to say that we need help. There is new research for diagnosis and treatments that are occurring in the world. Norway physicians are using a chemotherapy drug with good results. Researchers at Bond University of Australia are studying natural killer cells at MECFS leading the way to a central immune abnormality. This is an international disease as it needs to be recognized and researched. There needs to be an ICD-10 classification for ME. There needs to be a better way to keep track of biospecimens from people with ME-CFS. A grant to the IACFS or the CFS Association could be made for an informational exchange of biospecimens with contact information, what kind of specimens, et cetera. New nonprofit organizations are aggressively asking for private contributions to fund research with many new ones in just the last year. But the lack of funding in this country for research is painful. As a result, the real advances are being made in Norway, where the clinical trials are happening, and in Australia, where experts are studying natural killer cells the hallmark sign of ME-CFS. There is also concern that the original pioneers like Dr. Peterson, Dr. Klimas, Dr. Bell, Dr. Krabernoff, Dr. Lapp, Dr. Bateman, et cetera, are all getting older, and there are not younger doctors to expand the field and fill their shoes. Doctor, you have there one more minute. Therefore, regional centers of excellence, which have been requested from this panel for years, continue to go ignored by this administration. These centers could accurately evaluate and diagnose patients and return them to their local physicians for treatment. Fellowships need to be funded. The old guard of physicians need to be utilized to pass on their unwritten knowledge to the next generation. My hope for the future is that medical textbooks will have a whole section on ME-CFS with etiology, diagnosis, and treatments, and that all physicians are aware of ME-CFS and how to treat it. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to uh, call Dr. Kenneth Friedman. Yes, Dr. Friedman? Yes. This is Nancy Lee at the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. Are you ready for your yes, test? Yes, uh, And you're going to have to speak into your phone directly to make okay. sure we can hear you. Um, excuse me, you have five minutes. All right. Thank you. I wish to inform the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee and other stakeholders in the ME-CFS community of an opportunity to, to potentially restore ME-CFS research education and related scholarly activities to one of this country's most populated states, New Jersey. The governor of New Jersey has formed a UMDNJ advisory committee to advise him as to the future of the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. UMDNJ, the largest freestanding academic healthcare university in the United States, could remain intact or could be dismantled with its components given to other state institutions. The impetus for a UMDNJ advisory committee may be the corroded image of UMDNJ caused by its purposeful $35 million double billing of Medicare. However, of concern to the MECFS community is the February 2010 university decision 
to ban ME-CFS research education and related scholarly activity. According to that policy, one, scholarly activity related to ME-CFS can only be performed outside of regular normal business hours. Two, the university's portal to the internet cannot be used for any ME-CFS related research. And three, the university's email client server cannot be used to correspond with anyone about anything related to ME-CFS. UMDNJ controls all three of the state's medical schools, as well as the state's only dental school, School of Nursing, School of Health-Related Professions, School of Public Health, and Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Its ban impacts patient care in the greater New York metropolitan area, as well as research and health care provider education and training throughout the United States. If the ban persists, other institutions may institute similar policies. UMDNJ's actions are clearly an attack on academic freedom, which is the right of college and university faculty to pursue their academic interests wherever they may lead and should be opposed on that basis. However, of particular concern to the MECFS community is the failure of UMDNJ to honor the CDC's MECFS policy as articulated by its director in 2006, Dr. Julie Gerberding, who stated, we are committed to improving the awareness that this, in brackets, MECFS, is a real illness and that people need real medical care and they deserve the best possible help that we can provide, end quote. Why does the Department of Health and Human Services continue to provide funding to UMDNJ when UMDNJ has decided that MECFS activity is not a professional activity permitted of its faculty? Why does the Department of Health and Human Services continue to give money to a university that knowingly and deliberately violates this CDC mandate? The UMDNJ Advisory Committee has received employee testimony expressing the belief that the university should be retained in its current configuration. Stakeholders of the MECFS community may have a different opinion, since dismantling UMDNJ would remove the ban and restore MECFS activities to New Jersey's health care centers. You have one minute, sir. Thank you. The CFSAC may wish to make a recommendation based upon the facts conveyed herein and its own further investigation. Comments may be submitted via email to publiccomment at gov.state.nj.us. The window of opportunity for submitting comments is not specified. I would not wait long. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. The next uh, person to speak by phone is Gabby Klein. Hello? Hello? Yes, is this uh, Gabby Klein? Yes. Yes, uh, this is Nancy Lee. I'm with the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. Are you prepared to give your comments? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, you have five minutes uh, so that we can hear you well. Please speak directly into your phone. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Gabby Klein, 
I'm a 56-year-old wife, mother, and grandmother. I have been suffering from the most severe, misunderstood, and ill-treated illness called MECFS for the past nine years. I used to be an active member of society. I worked full-time, raised my children, took care of the household, and did charity work. All this came to a halt in 2002 when I came down with a vicious virus that lasted for weeks. My health declined to the point that I was forced to quit my job. My GP was clueless of what to do for me. His medical training did not prepare him for this. All the other doctors I was referred to were disbelieving. The routine tests that they were taking were coming back negative. They thought I was exaggerating my complaints. Of course, they couldn't see my pain and suffering. This is an invisible disease. At last, I was lucky to find a specialist who finally diagnosed me with BFS. Unfortunately, by then, I was so ill with a heavy viral and inflammation load that it was impossible to reverse the damage. Had my GP recognized the problem right away, treatment might have helped me. At present, nine years after my diagnosis, I have become mostly housebound. I feel like I have the flu all the time and like I just hiked up the mountain for two days without sleep. I suffer from insomnia and constant severe headaches. I can't stand or walk for more than a few minutes. Most disturbingly, I suffer from cognitive problems which affect my memory, renders me unable to think clearly or speak comprehensively. When I do try to do some minor activity, all my symptoms become aggravated, and I have to lie still in bed in a dark room without any noise for a few days or weeks at a time. Could you imagine having seven grandchildren and you can't play with them because of your sensory overload? The noise causes sharp headaches. This is my most painful reality. This is a dread of disease. Dr. Mark Loveless, an AIDS researcher, commented, a CFS patient feels every day significantly the same as an AIDS patient feels two months before death. The name chronic fatigue syndrome coined by the CDC is an insult and denigrating. People tell me, I am fatigued all the time too. You should get out more and exercise. Or you look fine to me. I'm alone in my suffering. It is critical that this cruel name be changed if we want any advancement and improvement for this illness. Because of the way CFS is currently coded, it's almost impossible to collect disability. The International World Health Organization has been coding it since 1969 as a neurological disease. The UICC agrees. When will the U.S. catch up to the rest of the world? I belong to a CFS forum where someone posed the question asking people when did they believe that there will be treatment for us. It was very sad to read that the majority answered, not in my lifetime. Our only hope right now comes from the few doctors and scientists in the country who specialize and treat patients with CFS. Some private grants have been given to run sporadic studies. For example, I'm excited about the new NECFS Center at Mount Sinai in New York City that my specialist, Dr. Ann Lander, is part of. She you have one minute. He received a matching grant of $1 million from one of his patients. Many top specialists are joining this research effort. Dr. Eric Shad and Dr. Eva Singh who research genomics in the diagnosis of NECFS. Dr. Ann Lander will research new treatment modalities Dr. David Bell has expressed interest in joining Dr. Emlander in this project. They will be running studies and treating patients. Can you imagine what they could accomplish if they would get government funding? This illness drains the U.S. economy in the amount of $27 billion annually. Yet the NIH budgeted a mere $6 million for research this year. This makes no fiscal sense at all, yet this is what's happening. The cost to the patient of running after possible treatment is immense. Insurance policies will cover very little, if any of it. Some patients become penniless and homeless with no help from the government and its health agencies. Ms. Klein, Doctor, I need you to finish. Okay. Uh, I will court, play fair, don't hit people, 
say sorry when you hurt somebody. I think it's time for the U.S. health agencies to admit how they have neglected this population of very ill people and to bring proper awareness, proper funding, and proper care. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, we will now have Martina Nicholson in person. Is Ms. Ms. Nicholson here? Okay, uh, Robert Miller. Am I red? I'm You're red. red. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Robert Miller. I'm here today due to the drug Amplogen. Without it, I'm homebound. It's not a cure for me, but at least I'm not stuck home in bed. I must say there's been a lot of changes for this committee since the last meeting. Dr. Mangan's retired, Dr. Wanda Jones is gone, and half the committee members are new or about to shift. There's no live webcast for patients, which should be a must. But we have to keep from being distracted because more has happened in NIMI CFS since the last meeting. I'd like to thank the Blood Working Group and other scientists for pursuing the truth about XMRV. The story may not be over yet, but early on with it, I was hopeful that XMRV represented a real breakthrough. I also advocated for scientists to pursue their research until we had the truth. I wanted a yes or no answer. Lots of American science says it isn't XMRV, so once again we know that MECFS or what MECFS is not. Last week, scientists in Norway published data showing that rituxan, a B cell depleting drug used for lymphoma, had dramatic results on a small group of MECFS patients. It's blown the lid off of science again because if these results hold up, a primary conclusion is that MECFS is an autoimmune disease. I thank the Norwegians for doing their study, but I want to point out that years ago, an American CFS patient who developed lymphoma had the same experience with rituxan. I remember him telling me how he felt better having cancer and getting treatments than he did with CFS. The higher incidence of lymphomas in MECFS patients is not a coincidence. So I'm asking myself now, do I have to go to Norway to participate in a promising drug trial? Why didn't American scientists pursue the rituxan experience years ago in the US? When will American scientists be funded properly to prove what MECFS is, not just to prove what it is not? The answer is that NIH and CDC are neglecting MECFS patients. NIH and CDC's tiny budget for MECFS is going towards disproving XMRV. 10% of NIH's measly $6 million a year budget is now going to researchers at Stony Brook to test self-treatment models. Really? Conserve my energy and feel better? I mean, really, again? I and other patients protested NIH and CDC's neglect this morning because we need real science to solve MECFS, and we need clinical trials to learn what works and what doesn't. We don't need GET or CBT. We've done that for 25 years and it doesn't work. We'll need serious research, serious funding, serious clinical trials for a serious immune-based illness. And if making us well is not reason enough to do it, then do it so you can save $20 billion a year that it costs this economy. I'd like to end with a video from President Obama, who actually made a statement and said it best. We in the patient population call this the Obama promise. It's up to you and me to use our brains to figure things out. And I believe that we can figure this out. President Obama. syndrome, which is an illness very much like multiple sclerosis, um, and... Got a microphone covered. 
Mr. President. Um, my name is Courtney Miller, um, and I want to thank you for returning science to the national priority. Um, and I need to ask for some help for my family. Um, my husband has chronic fatigue syndrome, which is an illness very much like multiple sclerosis. Um, and we spend billions of dollars in this country on roughly a million patients for disability and Medicare and lost tax revenue and lost productivity. Um, and we spend less than $6 million for NIH research on this illness. And I'm asking you for my husband and my kids who want their father to be able to go to their baseball games if there's a way to make improvements in that. Well, let me first of all say that you are absolutely right that we've tried to put science back where it belongs. Uh, you know, I, I, am, I am a Christian and a person of faith, uh, and I believe that, that God gave us brains to figure things out. And that, and that, you know, we've got to we've got to use science to to make life better for for our families and, and our communities and this planet. Um, that's one of the reasons why part of the Recovery Act was reinvesting in uh, National Institute of Health (NIH), which is does a huge amount of the basic medical research that ends up then creating uh, so many of the scientific advances that are making our lives longer and making our lives better. Now, I will confess to you that although I've heard of chronic fatigue syndrome, I uh, don't have expertise in it. Uh, but based on the story that you told me, uh, what I promise I will do when I get back is uh, I will have uh, the National Institute of Health uh, explain to me what they're currently doing and start seeing if they can do more uh, on this particular ailment. Okay? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Is Gabby Klein back in the room? Yeah, I am. I am. Did, oh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Matina Nicholson. We did Gabby Klein. Speak now. This is your chance. Okay. Uh, Jennifer Spatilla is by phone. Yes, Jennifer, this is Nancy Lee at the CIFSAC meeting. Are you prepared for, to give your testimony? I am, thank you. Um, you have five minutes, and make sure you speak directly into your um, microphone. Don't use a speakerphone, because we, we'll hear you better that way. Thank you. Sure. I ask the voting members of this committee, do you think this committee is effective I believe that all of you serve with the best interests of patients in mind, but let's examine the track record or lack thereof for your own recommendations to the Secretary. Regional Centers for Research and Clinical Care? No. Healthcare Provider Education and Training? No. Use of the name MECFS across all agencies? No. Research funding commensurate with the burden of this illness? No national effort to arrive at a new consensus case definition? No. No, 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 no. No meaningful action, no meaningful funding. All your work and what is there to show for it? You should be angry or at least frustrated. Five years ago, you recommended that NIH issue a new RFA on CFS. It didn't happen. Many patients expected new funding to be made available after the state of the knowledge meeting. 
It hasn't happened. You know there is an urgent need for research funding, and we need you to hold HHS accountable. Today, I urge you to recommend that NIH issue an RFA for CFS research backed by at least $10 million in funding, and that this RFA be issued in the next six months. This recommendation is specific, actionable, and measurable. Furthermore, this money must be spent on CFS, not related conditions, and no more money should go to CBT or other psychological approaches. We have begged NIH to fund research into pathophysiology, objective diagnostics, and treatment. We have begged you to help us. I agree with Bob Miller that for NIH to spend $600,000 on Dr. Fred Friedberg's, quote, commercially viable program of illness self-management, close quote, is an insult to every CFS patient. At the State of the Knowledge meeting, Dr. Collins said that Secretary Sebelius had directed NIH to give CFS special attention. Today we learned about a new HHS working group on CFS, but talking is not doing. I say we test this alleged commitment to CFS. Make the recommendation that NIH issue a $10 million RFA for CFS research in the next six months. At the next meeting of this committee, we can see if special attention actually translates into meaningful action. I do not accept woe is me budget talk from federal officials and neither should you. We know that money can be found for high priorities. Dr. Fauci's appropriation of $2 million for the Lipkin XMRV study proves that. Money is available but the agency leaders are making conscious choices to spend the money elsewhere on illnesses that are a higher priority. NIH's fiscal year 2012 budget request is for $32 billion. Can anyone seriously believe that there is no money in that budget to increase research on CFS? Do you believe that this massive budget cannot be squeezed to find a few extra million for CFS research? The current level of NIH funding for CFS research is the equivalent of pocket lint. Do not dare to tell us that there is no money for CFS research. The money is there. It's just that NIH doesn't think we're worth it. While HHS fiddles, our lives are burning. Physician education, we do that every time we go to the doctor. Consensus case definition, researchers and clinicians, not NIH and CDC, have participated in devising case definitions based on true evidence. You have one minute. Thank you. CFS research, we fund that ourselves. Nonprofits are funding pilot research that only then can secure government funding. All these years, we have done this work and we will continue to do this work in cooperation with researchers and clinicians. But I say to all of you, you are not off the hook. As long as we have to deal with CFS, you have to deal with us. We are still here. Deal with it. Thank you. We have uh, another person by phone, Melanie Pruitt. number you have dialed is not in service. Mm -hmm. Let me try this once more. And then otherwise we need to see if we can find that number. The number you have dialed is not in service. So, I, I was going to move. We got it. We got it. So you're going to look for it? Yes, we got it. Marty? What? 
the numbers? Yes. So if you could look and see if we have a better number for Melanie Pruitt. And in the meantime, uh, Denise Lopez Mahon, are you, yes. Denise Lopez Mahono, Mahano, will, will be reading a testimony on behalf of her son, Alexander Lopez Mahano. Yes, thank you. We have five minutes. Good afternoon. I've been asked about the biggest obstacles I face because of MECFS. We all know about the paucity of successful treatments. We all know about endless problems finding knowledgeable medical professionals. Beyond that, some of the biggest obstacles are daily struggles for acceptance of the severity of MECFS that stems from the erroneous perception that this is a psychological condition. MECFS is not a psychological condition. It is a horribly disabling physical illness. I want more education. I want a profession. Since I can only leave the house two times a week, since I can only study for 20 minutes at a time, perhaps three times a week, it probably will take a long time for me to obtain a college education. Unfortunately, it will probably take a long time to then find a job. This should not be the case. There, needs, there need to be successful treatments for MECFS. There need to be many more medical professionals who know about MECFS, respect patients, and who treat MECFS. We must move forward. You must define patients uniformly. You must disseminate accurate information widely and often. Work hard. MECFS needs to be solved soon. I want my life back, and so does my brother. Thank you. Try dialing it for me since sure. I was not successful. <laughs> <laughs> you have to dial nine. Yeah, dial nine and then one. Mm Is this Melanie Pruitt? Yes, it is. Yes, um, this is Nancy Lee at the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. Are you ready to give your statement? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, you have five minutes. Please make sure you speak directly into the phone and don't use a speakerphone because that way we'll hear you better. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Melanie. This December at Christmas time marks 10 years since I caught the virus that led to this long road of illness with MECFS. My youngest child is 18, which means he was, he's lived more of his life with a very sick mother than not. I've been a committed attendee to the CISAC meetings, getting up very early to listen and watch online from my couch or bed here in the Pacific Northwest. First, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you for your continued interest and the heart you show for patients like me. I have never added my voice to the public testimony before, but this time I'd like to share with you two things that have become incredibly important to me. First, living in a small town here in the Pacific Northwest means that I am very far away from any of the great specialists that care for MECFS patients. Several years into my illness, I had to fly across the country to even get an official diagnosis. I have heard it said that if my doctor isn't familiar with MECFS or doesn't acknowledge its existence, that I should find another doctor. But that is not as easy as it sounds. 
No doctor's office will tell me if they deal with ME-CFS patients due to confidentiality rules. To meet the doctor, I must go in for an initial appointment, which I rarely have the energy for. I went for one such appointment, and the primary care physician that I had at the time immediately dropped me because I was, quote, seeing another PCP, unquote. It takes a long time to get to know a new doctor and develop a relationship of trust. It takes a long time for her to get to know me and trust me. Changing doctors over and over can give me a bad reputation. I have also found that though a, a doctor may sound like they are willing to care for a patient with ME-CFS, they may not actually know anything about it. I have yet to come across a PCP who is willing and able to invest their time into fully understanding my illness. My first urgent request is that you continue to address and pursue ways to educate primary care physicians on ME-CFS. I try hard to bring straightforward, reliable information with me to my appointments without overwhelming my doctor. But it would be so much better if there was one reliable place with current, up-to-date symptom and treatment information that I could direct my doctor to. PCPs today need information to be efficient. We need an authoritative research resource for our PCPs. Maybe it could be organized by symptoms so it was quick and efficient. Then my PCP wouldn't have to learn ev everything about ME-CFS all at once, but could help me and learn piece by piece. Even though there are no ME-CFS specialists in my area, I have come across caring PCPs that would make use of such a resource. Currently, the CDC website is completely inadequate, and as others have stated today, in fact, it does us great harm. You all understand the need for efficiency. You understand the need for information to be from a reliable source. So I plead with you to remember this everyday need of patients like me. Secondly, I've had the great privilege of traveling to be evaluated and treated by one of our top ME-CFS specialists. I am a middle-class American, one that is lucky to have good health insurance coverage. And yet, even with this high-profile insurance company, I have spent eight months working with one representative to get my visit with this specialist covered. Before I went, I was told by my company that they would cover this visit as long as I had billing codes and told by the provider that appropriate codes would be provided so I could get reimbursed. And yet it's taken eight months for these codes to be coordinated. I'm still waiting on codes and items to be processed. It seems that medical coverage comes down to billing codes, and MECFS issues and treatments are very difficult to fit into regular coding. Now, I'm not trained in medical billing codes. I don't pretend to even understand all of this. But clearly, if this very large insurance company is struggling to coordinate codes with this wonderful provider, something is wrong. I urge you to continue to address the issue of insurance coding and MECFS. Aside from the expense and difficulty traveling with MECFS, I find now that I may not be able to afford medical support from a specialist for my MECFS, even with one of the best insurance policies around. You can hardly imagine what a hopeless feeling that is. Thank you for hearing my concerns today. Thank you very much for caring. Thank you. <laughs> After this discussion. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So we're going to go in. It's uh, if Galen, if you'd like to. Share your wisdom with us. We decided that it was a little early for a break, and that we'd met, unless, because we just had one for lunch, and so we thought after this discussion we could have a break. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. Okay. And I, I know Galen said he had some a few slides. I didn't want to give anybody a chance to escape, Galen. <laughs> <laughs> Especially who? Lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> he has to pull it up. So. Anyway. Uh, why don't you stand over there and, and I can um, go advance the slides. Okay, we're going to spend a little time talking about 
the idea strategies as it relates to fu future interdisciplinary research for MECSF that's going to require a variety of scientific uh, disciplines. Uh, Nancy, if you go to the first slide. Uh, that's smaller than I thought, but I'm sorry about that. There, there are real challenges to interdisciplinary translational research, and I think most of the members of the committee may already appreciate this, certainly those that do research. There are a few of the members that don't, and our, our advocates and audience, many of them do not. So I've always felt that it's always worthwhile to have a little vocabulary lesson so people know at least what you're talking about, because the first point of that slide is that the same scientific term can have different meanings to different stakeholders in terms of how they interpret it. For example, um, those of us that take care of patients, uh, there's a broad variety of uh, use of the term psychosomatic. I suspect most of our advocates, if I walked up to them and I said, I think you have a psychosomatic illness, I would want to make sure I was out of arm's length because the, the colloquial use of that term in our society is that it's all in your head and it's not real. And I think we've heard clear evidence uh, with passionate uh, uh, folks uh, speaking, and those of us that take care of these patients are well aware that it's not all in their head. Yet, no one can argue that there's a single category of illness that does not affect one's mind when one has a physical illness any more than certain mental illnesses we know there are physical manifestations. The mind and the body are inseparable. Having said that, uh, unfortunately in our society, anything that is real can be determined below the ears is worth treating. Anything that is above the ears is not worth treating or it's not really important. That's a tragedy in our allopathic medical system and I agree with Nancy. Uh, on behalf of my profession, I apologize. It, it, it wasn't always that way. A hundred years ago, physicians would never dream of acting like our profession acts to uh, you all as patients. And there are those of us that believe that that will change. Uh, not fast enough, but it will ultimately change. There are cultural and social influences, and I've just described perhaps one of the major, major ones. There's even clinical versus basic influences. Trust me, uh, uh, working in an academic medical center, the basic science faculty and the clinical faculty are at each other's throat with some degree of regularity and they approach the same uh, problem from a research standpoint from very different perspectives. Personal professional bias uh, perspective is true as well. And the analogy I like is that old Arabian proverb of the 10 blind men and the elephant. They could all feel, one could feel of uh, the tail, one could feel of uh, the trunk, one could feel of uh, the leg, and they all had very different perspectives of trying to describe the elephant. The nice thing about that analogy is that what they could have benefited from was an 11th person who could take the data from the other 10 and synthesize an overall description, which probably would have been a very accurate description of what an elephant really is like. Uh, the, uh, a natural conflict exists in the approach to information between scientists and clinicians. Scientists are trained, and, and again, just for background, I was a basic scientist who went to medical school. I went to medical school with the intent of gaining a degree so I could go back to the lab and make more difference. What I didn't realize is they put a stethoscope in my life, in my hand, and I fell in love with taking care of patients as well. So I'm well aware of this dichotomy between the mindset of how you're trained as a scientist and how oftentimes you're trained as a clinician. Scientists look for generalizable knowledge that may ultimately be applicable to people. In contrast, Clinicians care for the individual patient by balancing the components of the illness that are generalizable, what we now call evidence-based medicine, with our fundamental responsibility to acknowledge and deal with the individual variability that make each one of us unique human beings. So truly translational research has to account for both perspectives while remaining objective to the results derived from the study, in other words, the idea of following the data. Uh, the a priori understanding that no single intervention works for everyone, even with the same cause. If you don't believe that, remember that there are right now 67, 67 different antibiotics that are marketed to treat bacterial pneumonia because not every person responds exactly the same. Now the difference is, is that if they have bacterial pneumonia, they're likely to try to find an antibiotic. They're not gonna to try to get them to do cognitive behavioral therapy. 
So there's a difference between the approach to it that there may not be a single approach and the approach of acknowledging the underlying ideology of the illness. Next, next slide. There, uh, many research efforts are also discipline egocentric. Uh, the old idea that it's not real if it doesn't have a p-value of less than 0.05, and then the other extreme of that is that if it does have a p-value of 0.05 or less, that makes it real. Neither of those statements are true. And then of course, using my methodology is the only correct way to look at this problem is again, how we're trained. It's what we get used to, and there are many different methodologies used to address the same question. Uh, that's a fundamental problem of science, particularly at the clinical level, that many of us are uh, dealing with in and outside of MECSF research. The reverse translational research approach is basically the idea, and as was pointed out to me earlier today in conversations with my colleagues, the classic translational research model is bench to bedside and back again. You formulate a mechanism, you see if it might work, and then you come back and see how to modify it from there. The reverse actually starts with the patient, and it collects the information from the patient, and it says these are the problems that we're seeing. It's almost, an, by definition, an epidemiology type approach, and from that you formulate ideas that might have common mechanisms and common rationales for similar interventions or at the very least, by seeing the variability among the population that you would assess, you can then try to account for the variability in response. Either of those would be then the classic reverse translational, I, I won't call it classic because it's sort of a newer idea, it shouldn't be, but it's sort of a newer idea of the reverse translational research approach. And then finally, uh, uh, approaches using biomarkers themselves need very strong clinical correlates. Some are relatively clear. There are good biomarkers for tumor burden. There are good biomarkers for renal function. When you go on dialysis, you know that your kidneys are not working anymore. There are good biomarkers associated with survival and mortality. Unfortunately, many of the challenges with CSF research is a, is a lack of clear clinical correlates in terms of etiology or, as I believe, plural etiologies, variable symptom complexes, um, and then the idea of overlap syndrome. If you listen to most people, and, and again, of the folks that I care for, and the ones that I've listened to others that care for them as well, there are very few of them that say, I just have seven of the eight criteria and I have nothing else that goes wrong. People have other things that go wrong with them. Some of them have to do with chemical sensitivity. Some have to do with things that are they're labeled uh, CSF fibromyalgia. Some are labeled because they have titers against Borrelia. Some are given autoimmune etiologies. And I think what we have to understand as we approach research is that are these truly overlap syndromes, and that term largely comes from rheumatologists talking about overlaps from different serological diagnoses, or are these modifiers or are these cofactors? And I think addressing that and understanding it is critically important as we address what we're trying to do, which is to find biomarkers that have clinical correlates that can be measured in a large population of patients. Next. Uh, so recommending the translational research pr priorities, basic science approach, what they do, or what we do, I guess, because I wear that hat as well, is to identify the question, identify the population, identify the system we're gonna use to study them, and then design the study with adequate control. So the goal, again, is to only have one single variable. So if you have, for example, if we wanted to study MECSF uh, fibromyalgia overlap, and we wanted to study the pain in MECSF compared to the pain in fibromyalgia. Ideally, what you would want is to compare the study with the overlap, and I'm, this is my term, it may not be the right term for others, versus those who had pure, uh, quote unquote, fibromyalgia, versus those who had pure MECSF. Now, now the devil's in the details with the, what that word pure means. There, therein lies the problem. Data analysis plans and ultimate conclusions and therefore applications are highly dependent on how those things are done above. And interdisciplinary research, not multidisciplinary research. The 10 blind men and the elephant were the multidisciplinary. The 11th person who could see and integrate what they had been told by the others would be the true interdisciplinary researchers, would be important to decide on a definition of the illness. What is the essential criteria? 
And this would be independent of having to come up with a new consensus diagnosis or, or consensus criteria. Th that's a laudable goal. That's something that should be done. But it's not something that we have to wait on to do effective interdisciplinary research with MECSF patients. But particularly if we're going to do an intervention, we've got to decide who we're intervening for. What is the characteristic of the population that we're intervening for? Determining minimal data that are necessary for comparative study. And uh, Dr. Jason has led the group that I've been privileged to have a little bit of part in that's done an elegant job in writing a paper uh, that discusses this and will be discussed more at tomorrow's meeting. Careful, constructing, uh, constructed, uh, careful construction designed to optimize the answers to the research uh, question. Very important to construct it carefully and then strong consideration of the confounders and modifiers, both psychological, physical, pharmacological, et cetera. All of these are things that are just basic principles to translational research. Next. Uh, and these are the different groups that are, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but that's a pretty big list already of individuals that would be important for interdisciplinary research to be effective in MECSF because each one of those, both in terms of basic science disciplines on the left and clinical science disciplines of the right, are individuals for which even at this meeting and Again, those particularly like Dr. Levine and Dr. Klimas, who take care of a l much larger population than I, that they see these variations on a regular basis. So getting input from these experts is extremely important for these interdisciplinary researchers. So all this segues into the question for discussion, next please, Nancy, is this is a provocative statement for discussion, knock it down, it's the straw man that we've put up here for discussion, and that is approaches to MECSF research should be focused on a reverse translational model. And what I will do is nothing more than facilitate the discussion with your permission. Just facilitate the discussion and then maybe have a comment or two. And do we have fifth to four? For an example, so, and Nancy suggested I give an example, and let's give a, let's give a very clear one. Let's, let's use rituximab as an example because it's such a neat one. Uh, here, the, if you read the paper, the PLOS paper that uh, was just published, the investigators, based upon the fact that they saw some observation that was mentioned was not a Norwegian observation, was in fact a repeat observation from people in this country uh, that had been treated with rituximab in the past for a clinical indication, their symptoms improved. Now, there is a very interesting theoretical reason to explain why, and Nancy and I have been going back and forth having a wonderful science conversation about why you might expect rituximab to work in certain patients, maybe all patients, who knows, with MECSF, because if uh, B cells are a reservoir for certain types of latent viruses and you get rid of the reservoir, the viral titer is going to diminish. The viral titer diminishes. The individual doesn't have to respond to the virus. The individual gets better. It's a very interesting logic. Very testable hypothesis. A classic reverse uh, translational research. So th that's a good place to start and we'll just open it up for discussion. L Dr. Jason, you look like you'd be ready to start. <laughs> Go ahead. Leonard Jason from DePaul University. Um, Lenny Jason from DePaul University. And Galen, you know, you, you, you kind of asked me to say something before you raised my hand. I just saw the urge, Lenny. But, but you're right, I was going to ask something. So, you could have tell Lenny. Reverse translational <laughs> questioning. So, so I guess, the, you, know, you know, certainly um, you can have an intervention that affects multiple illnesses. Um, and, and, and that could very well be the case with what the last example um, involved with a variety of autoimmune illnesses. I guess the question that I have is, from all the things that you've been talking about, which is kind of selection of a group of individuals, um, testing them, looking for potential biomarkers, um, developing treatment programs, um, isn't there some basics that you start with for example, saying we're dealing with lung cancer or we're dealing with heart disease or we're dealing with AIDS or HIV, that then in some ways all those definitions have changed over time. HIV, AIDS, the criteria has changed over time. So it's not a question that 
criteria can't change over time, but that they do have a criteria. And each of these fields has something that brings all the scientists together to say, yes, this is it, this isn't it, and that we basically at that point are able to kind of build this pyramid, almost like a pyramid of cards, but it's based on saying, we think these people have a particular illness or disease. And I'm wondering, isn't that the starting point for anything we do in basic research? No question about it. Uh, HIV is an interesting example, but I'll go further back than that. Go back to the example of real research in cancer. Uh, I grew up in Texas, and the first research job I actually had was at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center when I was in high school, more years ago than I would like to admit. And in those days, their understanding of cancer was in many ways almost trivial by today's comparison. If you looked at, they understood what cancer did, and they thought of it as one disease, cancer. And what we came to understand, and their approach to therapy was really very uniform. And over time, with that single armamentarium of interventions, which might have a surgical component they recognized very early on, they couldn't cut it all out, though if you go, let, allow me a little license for a moment in a pretty famous movie, John Wayne's last movie called The Shootist. If you remember, uh, Wayne had what was most likely rectal cancer, colorectal cancer. And indeed, if you go back and read from near the turn of the century, which was the timing of that movie, there was a medical literature about how to treat it, and it was purely surgical. They tried to cut it out, and they did it uh, as well as they could, and it always grew back, and it always killed the patient. Chemotherapy was a relatively later uh, development. Radiation therapy was an even later development, but it was still thought of the same disease in different manifestations. Over time, what we all have come to understand about cancer is that while there's a commonality of biological and clinical characteristics that define a malignant cell and therefore a patient who has cancer, there are departments of every organ system cancer in every major cancer centers. And even general oncologists now in private practice tend to specialize in one group of cancers or another. There are breast cancer oncologists in private pra practice, not just at MD Anderson, Dana Farber. So that model is not an unrealistic model to start in, the only objection to that that I have early on is that, for example, rituximab, because we started with that, that's an extraordinarily expensive drug, number one. Number two, it is not without side effects. Knocking out somebody's B cells in, in a drug that was designed to get rid of malignant B cells is not trivial from an immunological standpoint. Number three, it assumes certain things that may not be true, and that is, for example, the fact that a B cell is a reservoir for a virus does not mean that patient has an autoimmune disease. I'm a T cell biologist by training. There are T cell mediated autoimmune diseases, and there are lots of B cell diseases that are not autoimmune in that they're not making autoantibodies that attack the body. So by Looking at a criteria and just even from the standpoint of sorting them into those who have autoantibodies and those who don't in their serum, but they have a common clinical uh, complex. And again, that's the fun part. Get 20 clinicians in a room and let them argue about what is the common clinical presentation of CSF. Uh, and I think you'll get about 25 different answers. But once you come up and say, all right, they have to be in this category, have to be in this category, they have to be in this category for this initial study. And again, if you read the Norwegian study, they did that. They did that and they put them, they were common enough but that they put them in there, but then you would divide them into people that have a biomarker or the absence of it. They have autoantibody, they don't have autoantibody. Would that be a predictor of how they might respond to this? That is a reverse approach to translational research that uses principles that are not new. These are principles that have been around for 50 years. And, but it's using them in a rational way where we're finally moving forward and methodically evaluating these. And as quickly and as rationally as we can, 
begin to provide to the clinicians the idea of uh, this is a group of patients that you would be more likely to expect to respond to this compared to others. When they do clinical trials in cancer trials, they don't come up with a re they come up with a regimen they'll think that will work on the organ system that they're interested in. In other words, breast cancer versus prostate cancer versus brain cancer. And they would not bring a prostate cancer patient into a brain cancer protocol on the argument that that, that regimen would not be expected to work, so they're not gonna submit them to that. We need to, with these powerful drugs, we need to get there as quickly as we can without systematically excluding someone else until we know better. That early trial, they put, they put colon cancer, they put brain cancer, they put lung cancer more or less into the same group until they found out what was beginning to work and what's not. So it's a balance between those two. So Gail, and I'll, I'll let Nancy kind of jump in right after us. I mean, in a sense, you've, you've made a great argument that in, there are many subtypes even lung cancer, you're not gonna treat all types of lung cancer the same way. There's different types of lung cancer. So there's specialization that has occurred within cancer um, over the last 50, 60 years. Um, but still, they basically can say, we're dealing with cancer. And, we're, and, and we are a situation where we're gonna have subtypes too. There are gonna be individuals with MECFS that have immune or orthostatic or, or other types of issues that possibly aren't comparable. So there probably will be subtypes. We, we think we all know people, for example, who never get a cold, and some people who get colds all the time with this illness. So we know that there's some clinical differentiations. So I guess the, the question I come back to is, if we learn from history, from some of these other organ systems, from these other diseases, haven't most of those illnesses and diseases started with a paradigm involving people coming together saying, we are going to classify people this way. It might not be right completely, but at least we're gonna have an agreement on that so that we can compare samples across laboratories. And without that, are we always going to be at a disadvantage to ever be able to find uniform biomarkers? Well, I think you're making the case for that statement. And that is that you start with the clinical complex and then you move to the biomarkers to help explain the clinical complex because candidly, that's a really more cost-effective way to do it. And it has the potential to begin to address the value of the interventions that we propose because it forces us to think about what outcome marker do we want. I suspect, again, if, if I could ask each one of the folks out here who suffer with this illness, what would you rather have me to show you I can do this therapy and it'll improve my biomarker or it'll make you better able to function? They don't care about the biomarker except as it helps them to be able to function. And again, in our earlier conversation, the, the, the clinical research world is littered uh, it, with a graveyard of biomarkers that people spent billions on, well, millions anyway, trying to show relevance because early studies showed a statistical association and they didn't get anywhere with it. So I'm simply suggesting in this discussion is that rather than starting from some consensus diagnosis that people that have MECSF meet this criteria is to go out and take uh, the Susans and the Nancys and the others who see these, and, and the Anns, I'm sorry, Ann, you're here now, so I'll, you're in the group too, <laughs> that see these patients all the time, people like me that see them some, and Dane and others who see them in different research setting, and you yourself as you see them, and get us in the same room and say, okay, how would we categorize these people clinically? And then from that, go back into the lab and say, are the markers there, are they not there? Is there interventions that would be useful? And so on and so forth. That's actually a very old school approach that I think is going to be more likely to give us some ideas and get others outside of our community to take these patients and this line of research more seriously. Now, Nancy had something she wanted to say, and then Dane, your next step. Dane was actually waiting the longest, so. Uh, no, it was Steve, not oh, me. Was it? No. Well, are you gonna run this, or am I? Well, yeah. yeah. Just, tell, just tell me. If you're gonna run it, that's fine. I'll run it, because you have to okay. watch, but who puts the hand up? <laughs> All right, 
Alex. And if you're involved in the conversation, it's difficult. That's fine. Go, Steve. That's really exactly what happened with fibromyalgia. Because in 1987 or 88, a group of ex people who are dealing with it got together and said, what's the core of what we have to accept to do research on this condition? And they did the study on tender points. And since then, there was an explosion of, of research on that. And in chronic fatigue syndrome, it's always been, for lack of a better term, a kind of a mushy diagnosis with a lot of disagreement. And I'm, I'm sort of on Lenny's bandwagon. At some point in time, there, even, even if you use a clinical approach to defining it, you need to define what we're talking about at some root level so that you can begin to identify your populations to study, to get to your biomarkers or whatever else you want to study about it. Well, I'm on the, I'm on the same bandwagon. I'm yeah. simply saying we start with the clinical criteria, not with some consensus diagnosis definition, no matter whose they are, because not everyone fits into there categorize the individuals on the ground in terms of what they're dealing with in their everyday lives. My guess is that if you ask clinicians that care for patients on a regular basis with this illness, they'll tell you they can sort of do some groupings in their own mind of the kind of patients that they see. Start there and work backwards. That's the reverse translational model that I had but, in mind. But why couldn't you just start with the Canadian consensus and decide for better or for worse, we're going to use that definition and then study the patients and see how it falls out. And the problem is, is there hasn't been any agreement as to whether you use the Fukuda criteria or, or whatever to do the research and really push it forward. So it's just a thought. I think I understand what you're going on. And that would, by, that would be like saying, let's study, let's study, uh, let's use a criteria where we're going to study Fords versus Chevrolets versus Chryslers. And, and if you talk about, and then we're going to study trucks, Ford trucks versus Chevrolet trucks versus Chrysler trucks, and then we're going to study, uh, we're going to do pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. The more specific you can get, the better off you're going to be as you begin to ask questions backwards about saying which one's going to be able to pull such and such a load better or not. Mm -hmm. Which subpopulation of patients are going to respond to an intervention? If all you're doing is saying, I'm going to categorize them based upon what is fairly broad categories to start out with. Maybe, maybe this approach, this reverse approach, would work fine that way. So it leads back into a consensus diagnosis, because, uh, consensus criteria. Certainly the people that designed those didn't design them in a vacuum. They used clinical information to do it. Right, but they all sat around and, and talked about what they were seeing in their practices, and some saw widespread pain, and some felt they had tender points or trigger points, and they then did a study of the tender points, because that seemed to be something everybody was talking about. So which ones of the 30 or 40 of them on the body are we going to use that give us a, a specificity and, and reliability to diagnose a significant number of people versus anything else? They, died, they were able to identify a group that they later found their way into clinical practice has produced another problem because they're leaving people out of the diagnosis whose tender points go away over time. So, but that's a problem you can deal with. What you really need to do is have a commonality of group. And I, I just threw out the Canadian consensus criteria because they exist. They're accepted by a lot of people. You could say, okay, let's start there. Let's use those and let's move forward with our research. And as the research develops, maybe you refine them more. But it just, I, I've been listening to this kind of discussion off and on for as long as you folks have. I mean, it's been years and years and years. And the difference between the fibromyalgia community and the chronic fatigue community is simply the agreement on a case definition and classification criteria. And I think had that happened in chronic fatigue syndrome, at least the studying would be farther along. My thoughts. Nancy. So I have two different points. And, and one I have to just mention, talk about case definition for a moment, because, because we use them for such different reasons. And it's really important that in all this conversation that you don't lose sight that researchers frequently attempt to narrow things down to the most hom homogeneous group possible at the expense of maybe even 80% of the rest of the population, if need be, to get at the, the guts of the core of what you can get from that core group. And, and we have to be careful in case definitions 
that we acknowledge that that was merely for research purposes because when we accept more narrow definitions, including the ICC, we are throwing out vast numbers of patients. And it will have a very real impact on their ability to get disability and so on and so forth because they no longer meet the case definition. So a research case definition, a clinical case definition to different animals, be careful. The first HIV case definition was men, 18 to 65, who were dying of a small series of infections. And, you know, now we know the iceberg thing, you know, that it wasn't that. It was, we needed to do that to get at the virus that caused that illness. But you could call but it classification 25% of people uh, with AIDS, dying of AIDS, right. didn't meet the case definition. Right. 25% in the first years. And I was there, I remember those things. So I would be careful that, that we don't tie ourselves into a brand new knot in all these case definition debates. Be careful, be careful. But that's not why I wanted to say something. I wanted to talk about, I love this concept of what you're calling translational models. I get so confused by the changing language of science, you know, because um, two years ago that was N of one studies, mm -hmm. right? So N of one meant that you saw something interesting in somebody and it made you think, right? And it made you reframe and rethink. And it's very important that we don't lose sight of those. I think one of the best N of one people I know is John Chia. John Chia, I don't know how he does that in his clinical practice, but he comes up with the most astute observations that, that he acts on and within a year or two it's changing the standard of care. It's phenomenal. And, and you know, we're talking about standards of care that are ephemeral in our group because we don't write them down and all act the same way. But, but when John gets up and says something, everyone's writing it down, you know, because the man has got some tremendous uh, belief in what he sees and an astute way of thinking. And I think every clinician in this, this uh, area uh, needs to pay attention to that because we learn so much from a patient who got better or from a patient who got worse on a therapy that was completely unexpected. It's just tremendously important. And we have very few ways to categorize this. Um, the few, few journals that would accept these kinds of, of, of observations. Uh, the bulletin, the IACFS bulletin certainly would. It may not, it's a peer review and it's, it's, it's not, you know, got a giant whatever score, but it, by gosh, it's a place to categorize these things and, and get them down. So if people would be, um, thinking about that in their clinical practices, a, a case study, well, case, a single case report, let's call them case reports. But we should be doing case reports, more and more case reports of interesting things. Hi, I, want, I wanted to agree with Nancy that I, I do agree that good clinical observations are very much needed in this, um, in this field. And I think um, the one area I disagree with Galen is that a chronic fatigue syndrome, unlike some of the other illnesses that are listed, you know, HIV, lung cancer we're talking about, they seem so restricted compared to the vast um, number of, uh, uh, of areas that chronic fatigue, you know, we, it involves the ner nervous system, the endocrine system. How do we rein in all the specialists you were talking about in this so-called interdisciplinary study? I mean, how do we get the geneticists involved, the endocrinologists involved? I mean, I'd like to sort of address that aspect of it. I can tell you as a clinical researcher, the, the, what always gets them interested are biomarkers. So the geneticists, you won't get involved in doing gene, uh, you know, they won't be doing microarrays to start out with looking at uh, their whole genome and see how a MECSF patient regards to that. But you know, Susan, you and I both know to clinicians what the genetic link means. It's called family history. And there, we, we all know there are too many cases where siblings get illnesses, parents get ill, and then the children get ill. Now, could it be infectious? Sure. But the fact is, is that unless, if they're different people with, with genetic background, in the fa similar genetic background in the family, some are getting sick and some are not, that begs the question of the genetic link. And when you talk to a molecular geneticist or a molecular epidemiologist about them, that usually gets them interested. Same argument with endocrinologists, uh, the, the postural hypertension subcomponent that they've talked about as the potential adrenal uh, uh, component. Well, when you invoke the adrenal gland, then you've got to invoke the pituitary gland, then you've got to invoke the hypothalamus, and you know this as well as I do. There, there's your endocrinologist. 
I think you do that by beginning to, as they begin to say, there is a potential input for that. Does everyone need Florinef? No. But are there some who might benefit from Florinef? Possibly. Uh, the ones that you'd be most likely to want to figure that out, seems to me, would be you'd start out with the ones who do have postural hypertension versus the ones that don't. And I'm just being naive about that. But as you design those ideas, what you're doing is you're engaging the different groups around. You don't go and pull them all in and say, we're all going to get in the same room and we're going to talk about it. You start with, candidly, the, those who would do the primary care of uh, these patients. Uh, if you were gonna do an intervention, you'd wanna bring some expert in who had some expertise in that intervention, since there's not yet anything been designed specifically for ME-CSF patients. It's gonna be from the outside coming in, and then you'd grow it from that. That's how I would see you would engage in an interdisciplinary team. You would not operate or go out and find 20 people and get them in the same room. I guess, and I just want to make this one quick point, I think it's clear from the last 20 years of doing this that I've had to be kind of a jack of all trades, so to speak, in my practice, and I feel that the, the complexity of the disease warrants almost becoming a new discipline, such as, you know, rheumatology is its own discipline. Like there should be, for instance, a chronic fatigue fellowship or that because of the, all the different aspects of it that one person just has to be trained in all the different, you can't just be an infectious disease doctor anymore and, and understand chronic fatigue, you can't be a rheumatologist. It, it, I think that would lead, I think edu education in terms of medical education has to make room for this as a whole new area because of the evolving complexity of it. I certainly agree with that and I think that speaks to the fact that what I think I hear you saying is that MECSF is a primary care disease, it's not a specialty disease yet. And I think that may be true, but it, I, I think there may, be come, there may come a time when subtypes of uh, MECSF patients will be cared for by subspecialists because their primary, clinical, uh, their primary clinical problem. I still think whatever the common mechanism is that explains the symptom complex and the physical manifestations of MECSF, I, I don't for a moment believe it's a single pathway to get there. I think there are different pathways to get there, and therefore, like many other illnesses we know, you treat the underlying problem, and then the central mechanism begins to resolve. The problem is right now we don't really have a clue as to what the central, we, we, we're beginning to get an idea of the central mechanism. We want to have a clue of what the underlying pathways are in individual patients yet. That's still, therefore, that's why, in my mind, it's very much a primary care illness. And you're right, in the context of primary uh, care, internal medicine, pediatrics, family medicine, MECSF should be a, there should be a rotation to MECSF clinics. By the way, let me put a plug into this, that there's centers of excellence, there's gonna be a more natural way for that to occur. So I'm listening to the conversation, I love it, by the way, and I'm, I'm trying to map sort of my mind, sort of draw some of the things that you're, you're, you're talking about doing, and, and I don't see any dissonance between Steve, I don't see any dissonance between your different approaches with the case definition, and I, I love what you said, Nancy, about being, you know, the warning to not try to force ourselves into little boxes yet. Um, because I think over time, these things will kind of, they'll play themselves out. I mean, if you, you start from Marshall's, you know, Galen's approach and eventually you'll, you'll meet someplace in the middle. I was just thinking about the idea of um, as, you, as you allow, as you work on the, the definitions, the, the clinical definitions that, that you want providers to focus on that to help them think through and look for when they're, when they're meeting, when they're working with their patients. Um, it, I, I can't help but I keep thinking of the concept, the Bayesian, the Bayes, what we were talking about, we were talking about Bayesian th theories before, where you're, you're, looking for, you're looking for the groupings, you know, you're looking for the larger percentage of folks who have a particular, a, a particular uh, expression, and then you sort of go, hmm, let's go and see what's, what's going on in that group that explains their particular expression, and then you have another group somewhere else, you know. Um, and then you try certain certain therapies on them, and they group out again, you know. And it helps you to focus really quickly on on what work on on the groups that are going to be most responsive to what you know to different to different therapies. So this this fits a little bit with that with that kind of 
and I think it's, I, I mentioned before that there's sort of this sort of Bayesian approach to research is, and, and even I believe at FDA it's starting to bubble up, fits with this model. And if you could draw it, I think it'd probably end up being something that there may be some nibbles. Well, I think we're all, you know, researchers have this tendency to come up with their own little paradigm and work from that, but I think the concept of this, and, and the question would be for the, what, what would the value be? Going back to what Nancy said about being careful about the research and clinical consensus, everybody remember what the Fukuda criteria were designed for. They were not clinical criteria, they were research criteria, and they ended up being clinical criteria. So uh, we have an unfortunate, very real example of what can happen in that context. And I have talked to a lot of clinicians who express that, again, like everything else, medicine is composed of human beings and they're bad apples in everything that, in all endeavors. And there are people who, for whatever reason, forgot the reason they went to medical school and the compassion they're there. But I think that doesn't describe the majority of clinicians. But what I think does describe whenever they hear MECSF is total confusion. What is it and what can I do about it? And it's not that they're not interested in doing about it, they just they feel helpless, just like everyone else. So if you can put something in their hands that says, um, this is what, th these group of people are gonna tend to respond in this way, these people, Bayesian, just like you said. So there's a value right there. The second value is that, and I, I'll let uh, Teresa speak for herself, but or for her own agency, I guess that's probably big too, but, but the idea, yes, well, congratulations. Uh, but the idea, seriously, is that the FDA, when we come to them and say, we want to, and, and we go with a sponsor, and we want to form, we want to do an IND to look at the applicability of this agent, and it would be a pharmaceutical agent, most likely, or I guess a device. I can't think of a device example right now. But a pharmaceutical agent to treat in MECSF they're gonna to wanna to know, okay, well, what's your endpoint? What are you gonna use? Dane pointed out in our earlier conversation that for fibromyalgia that they used three different measures, but the three different measures were for the assessment of one clinical outcome, that being pain. That they could show that that intervention was sufficiently better according to the criteria that the FDA has set that they got a, uh, they got a clinical indication for that. And then when you extend that to the things that Steve and others like him deal with, which are getting these things paid for, that's, gonna, that's the process in our society that's gonna be necessary. And we can talk till the cows come home about how it shouldn't be that way, and I would be the first one to talk about it. But, or we can try to work within the system to get our patients some relief in a time frame that would be of value to them. I think. Yeah. Well, I think this is a fascinating discussion, and but I think that we are already there. We have the biomarkers. If you were talking about um, that's the way to draw in a multidisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary uh, team to treat MECFS, we have the biomarkers. What, so what's the obstacle? And no offense here, but it has been political. We've, from our government agencies, in, in on the websites and the printed materials, they keep saying, we don't have biomarkers, we don't have biomarkers, but we do. We have um, HPA access, low natural killer cells, RNAs. We have the biomarkers. I remember Nancy Klimas going on camera uh, on Kim Snyder's film saying, biomarkers, we have biomarkers. So what, we, we have those, we just need our, I guess the health agencies and, and everyone to acknowledge that we have them and to move forward. The science is here. Why can't we do that? Well, as researchers, we have the as researchers we have the biomarkers. As clinicians, we do not. Therein is the, therein is the dichotomy. The dichotomy is that natural killer cells. Let, let's use that as an example. Natural killer cells. We still are not absolutely sure what the natural role of a natural killer cell is. We, there are very few patients that have been born that are deficient in natural killer cells, which is always a, in humans, that's how you figure out somebody's born without something, so you have an idea what they have. In animal studies that they've done where they've done natural killer cell mock, uh, knockouts, that is, is variable. 
Uh, we know, for example, that there are lots of things that are, uh, there are a lot of things that will affect natural killer cells that have nothing to do with a complex of MECSF, and there are MECSF patients that don't have abnormal natural killer cells. And I'm beating up this because I know this is a favorite of Nancy's. But I'm saying that simply because it is in, in someone who is a super, super specialist like Nancy, following natural killer cells in terms of things that she does to patients has a certain value because she has an expertise. She works with a lab. Uh, uh, first of all, the variability of quantitating natural killer cells from lab to lab is pretty substantial. So she has, within the context of what she does, but for the generalist out there to say an NK cell is a good biomarker for, let's just say, disease activity of an MECSF patient, is it, on a population basis, a research basis, that's true. On an individual basis, it's not true yet. And that's one of the emphasis that needs to be done is to take those biomarkers that are candidates just like, the, just like the therapies that are potential candidates and pull them into the clinic and show their variabilities and show their values for an individual patient. And I could go through a hundred different lab tests where that's where they needed to do. And we're not there yet with most of the biomarkers for regular generalist care. It takes people that are highly skilled to be able to do that. We've heard, we even heard in testimony today, there's so few of folks like that. And I don't even put myself in that category at all. There's so few people like that. Not everybody can get to them. There have got to be people that are out there, general internist, pediatricians, family medicine, emergency medicine people that can do a biomarker, say, this means I need to do this for this patient. That's that reverse translational approach. That's the component of what I'm talking about that needs to be done. Lenny, last question, and then we'll take a break. You actually had to do. Oh, I'm sorry. We had FDA. Just wanted to follow up with Dr. Marshall's comments and um, bravo. Um, you said a number of things that the FDA and our group in particular would resonate with um, that biomarkers need to be tied to feels, functions, and survives, which is how products are approved. I imagine that many of you, I could tell you that biomarker X is now normal. Congratulations. And you would say, okay, I still feel awful. So that doesn't help you any. So the biomarkers are wonderful to explore, but eventually we need to get to a point where those biomarkers mean something in a clinical trial. And certainly, you know, this field is so early on that you have to look at a lot of things in a clinical trial because we have no idea what the right endpoint is. But eventually we'll get there. And just a, a reminder that whatever endpoint we do get to has to be tied back, as Dr. Marshall said, to something that is clinically meaningful to the patient. Thank you. Chris, can I go after Nancy? Because Okay, sure. Because <laughs> he's going to anyway. <laughs> he's going to anyway. Um, what you say about biomarkers is very real. I think where we are right now is we know that patients are sick and they have poor function, and we can measure function, okay? I don't think it's very hard. And I think that, that um, yeah, the Ampligen study has been using exercise tolerance. There's uh, many different instruments that measure function. We're using actigraphs and other kinds of things. But there, there are ways to measure, measure uh, function. Now, a biomarker, in my mind's eye, uh, we've been using our biomarkers more to direct therapy, to better understand the mediators of illness and attack the mediator. And I think that's a phenomenal use of a biomarker. And then it's also a test of concept because you can measure all of the parameters that affect that mediator over the course of an intervention and see if your intervention was actually effective on the system you were trying to intervene upon. And so that's, I think that's a very exciting thing. But right now, I don't think there's anything to stop us from doing clinical trials using functional markers. And we shouldn't be sitting around on our hands waiting for the magic biomarker while we, uh, while we you know, have very reasonable interventions to put into play. So. Can, but I wasn't going to attack the NK cell, which, by the way, reflects the cytotoxic T cell, no, which, by the way, is one of Galen's favorite things. And by the way, that's very measurable in a reproducible fashion using a flow cytometer with a porphyrin and granzyme assay. But okay, I didn't say that. <laughs>
Well, <laughs> what she just said is absolutely true, but they don't do those in hospital labs. They do those in research labs. What they could do and what they do do are two different things. Can, can I just say, I had to give Nancy that chance to follow because, you know, this, this, this has really been, I mean, I, I've been on this committee four, four years, and, and truthfully, I want to thank Galen for just opening things up, giving us some time to think and to play around with ideas, and, and we haven't had enough of that. And I think this is exactly what we need to have at each of our meetings, some time where we can just sort of think and sort of think out of the box. One thing I'd like to sort of throw a couple out of the box ideas is that since this meeting has occurred, I've been tabulating how many times people said CFS and CSF. <laughs> and and I, I would just like to suggest that because we can't seem to pronounce the acronym right, why don't we get rid of the acronym? Yay. But on a more serious note, um, you know, in, in, we had a really interesting thing about case studies where one of our long-term 10-year follow-up study with um, patients with ME um, indicated that someone gained enough weight so that they had ME initially, and then 10 years later, they had a BMI that was no longer classified as um, ME. So it's a very interesting situation, I think, that we're talking about. Researchers can use certain case definitions for our purposes, but we can have clinical case definitions that can also be used, too. There's no reason that one obviates the use of the other. But the key thing that I, I wanted to kind of sort of say is that there needs to be an outcome for these types of discussions, because I think they're so critically important. And I think, and I would like to disagree with some of the clinical observations that people are making, I think it's really statistical methods and neural networks that are ultimately gonna derive this conversation. And I think there are methods that are being used in the sciences that we can bring into our field that can help solve some of our problems. Um, artificial intelligence being one of those ways that can really help us think through this, that can have computer models really help us in ways that we cannot. So, so I'm just gonna throw out the last point, and that is right now we have a, um, an Oxford criteria, a London criteria, a Fakuda criteria, Canadian 2003 criteria, an empiric variation of the Fakuda criteria, an Oxford criteria. Our science is not gonna be given legitimacy as long as we're always using different criteria. No one's gonna take us seriously. We have to deal with that issue at some point. So, so one thing, one thing that, that we could do is recommend that HHS convene a group of, of technical experts in this area to come up with an agreed set of criteria for research and publish it. You're the expert. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. <laughs> well, there is a, there is a paper that's coming up. But, That's really the segue. That's really the segue for Lenny's uh, discussion tomorrow, and that is is that I think that that's exactly what is going to happen. And I, I, my personal belief is that it's not going to happen inside the government. It's going to happen outside of it, and it's going to come from the scientists and the clinicians that will exert the pressure in the literature. Uh, if we call this a evidence-based thing. I think if you give the evidence, uh, it, you so so the HHS secretary convenes that and we have a nice big argument, and they get a proceedings out of it, and they're no farther along five years from now than they are now. Uh, I'm with Nancy. Let's get together and and come up with a set of criteria that are evidence based, uh, and you know this was purposely provocative, I think, and I would think it would be appropriate to summarize is that. Um, this is not going to be an either or, it's going to be a both and. I think we need to have a clear component of uh, reverse translational research as we ask the questions because that's going to help us formulate the questions. But I think we have to have an orderly scientific way that involves all the things that you were mentioning, Lenny, and others to allow us to do it. This is the whole idea of interventional research and that is, is that you've got to be able to ask the right questions before you'll ever get the right answers and then you've got to approach it with a methodology that calls in all the different things we can do. You just set up and say, all right, you get a group of people together and say, this is how we're going to define 
uh, MECSF, I'm still calling it that. I don't, I, 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 I slobber so much you can't tell where I'm saying it right or wrong. Uh, until, until, and we get together and we say that and we go to the FDA, we ask to do a clinical trial or we go to the NIH and we get a grant and examine something within the context of that. We publish those data in scholar, with scholarly literature. We follow the data, but we do that in a timely fashion that's got an application to it to help our patients as quickly and as rationally as we can. Remember the first dictum of medicine is above all, do no harm. We don't want to hurt people, but we can use that to sit around and do nothing for years. Uh, but I think we can use it to go and uh, we, we can go forward and we don't have to wait for an agreement in criteria. And I, I appreciate you l listing those because I was trying to do that a while ago and I missed two of them. Of how many different criteria they're out that each have their own advocate for, each saying this is the correct criteria and that, that most of us are kind of scratching our head and say, which one do we really want to use? That's exactly what went on with fibromyalgia in the 80s yeah. before they did that yeah. study. And I think, Steve, I think your point of bringing fibromyalgia to the forefront as a model for us to understand is really a very, very, very important thing to do because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to do that. Uh, they just reinvented that fibromyalgia well, wheel, by the way. Well, that, no, no I, mean the ori I mean the original wheel, not the current wheel. I, I know. <laughs> no, that, that, those are reinvented. proposed, proposed, proposed. Yeah, just one more. I know we're supposed to be calling it, but um, I, I just, just I if you right could. If you want to continue. There's another, another, another advantage to what you're talking about with the reverse translational research is the rapidity with which you're able to refine your, your right. hypothesis. And, and so as you draw that model, you know, including that, those loops, I think, will be really powerful. And I'm just saying you draw it. I mean, you don't have to draw it for me, but, you know, when I think of, once again, about things like the Innovation Center and some of the things they're interested in, it might be good to include that. You're, you're on. You're Can I just on. add a quick point to that? Uh, is one thing that we haven't talked a lot, or at least when I've been here, is about uh, the um, HHS's initiative around uh, electronic health records and how transformative that will, could really potentially be in a lot of arenas. And I know the Institute of Medicine has been doing a lot of work on the role that that can play in just really, really advancing comparative effectiveness research and really taking it to a whole other level because all of a sudden there will be this vast depository of data potentially that can be mined in a way that we've just never had before and that that can really feed into all types, of, all types of research. So I just wanted to point that out as well as another piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go. <laughs> I don't want to call this one break, but I just wanted to tag on to what you were saying, that going back to the beginning of the discussion, I don't know how easy it is to get experts to agree on a single definition. I, I again, I hate to bring that up, but uh, I I know a little bit about the activities of the map that's going on in chronic pelvic pain. I think bringing together a group of experts has actually taken four years to to agree on um, a definition which is not there yet. But maybe using the, the the electronic data and record as you were mentioning, you can probably start with a list of certain things that people agree on, and then. Um, maybe construct a certain set of criteria that you can look at and then maybe look at a greater number of symptoms or signs and try to see how the data actually cluster around based on what uh, Lenny was saying and maybe just see the patterns and just going again to the Bayesian networks, maybe you can just look at different subsets but probably have like a, at least um, uh, a set that you can start off with which are clinically based and maybe then look at biomarkers in those same subsets. And I think going back to the rituxi rituximab um, example that you gave at the beginning, I remember like back in the days when most of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors came around for lung cancer, uh, I think that there was a lot of excitement. So there was a mechanism that was found finally. And then when the drug was actually tried, it worked only for 10% of people with lung cancer. So then if you actually go back and test all the people with lung cancer for that specific mutation and only treat the people with the mutation, then you actually get 
90 to 100% effectiveness. So I think that's what we kind of need to do. We probably need to start off with the clinical definition, then look for biomarkers which can probably substratify patients and then base the treatment based on those biomarkers. But I think what that yeah. does in the design idea is that now you don't have to look for 60, 70, 80% response. Sure. A 30% response uh, compared to a placebo response of 5% should be plenty to get you, that, that should be enough of a signal to get you interested to say this could be a right. good therapy for the subgroup. The, the, the natural thing, again, because the community has felt so disenfranchised, appropriately so, I would agree, is that they want to play home run derby. They want it to hit it over the fence, and, and, if, uh, and then the skeptics say, well, this only worked in 30% of the individuals, so it's not useful. I think, we have to, I think we have to stand up and say that's crazy, because if it works in 30% of the individuals, that's 30% compared to a third of that or a fifth of that in the placebo group. There's a signal there. We need to pursue that signal, and that's something that this committee I think can have some impact on uh, back to the secretary as a recommendation. Okay, <laughs> but, but that speaks to large sample sizes, which typically we don't have in CFS. Research. Well, if there's 1.7 million active patients and maybe as many as four times more than that that are not diagnosed, I think that's enough to study if you get them together. Get them together and 10 minutes break. Thank you. Thank you.